Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast. What is happening, everybody? My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Let me talk to you. Yeah, and we have some stories to break down in the world of sports. It's been more or less a quiet week, except for some major stories that broke that we definitely have to do a little deeper dive in on. Mm-hmm. But we want to keep that conversation going with everybody. <coughs> so, Pad, where's everybody headed after the show? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. If you haven't swung by the website lately, make sure you do, because right there is all the social media links. And we like to talk to everybody after shows, before shows. We like to have that conversation keep rolling throughout the week. So it's always a fun time talking with everybody in the ODPH Society. So when you go there, make sure you're following, liking, and subscribing, and keep that conversation moving because that's what we like to do here. Also, remember to check out the T Public Store. Always a sale dropping left and right per se. That's what it kind of feels like to me, Pat. I don't know mm-hmm. about you. A little bit. So if you want to get some ODPH swag, that is the place to go. And definitely keep an eye when the sales are happening because they do happen quite often. And that's an awesome thing to see from T Public. Absolutely. Also, check out the Patreon, one tier, $2 a month, a bonus episode. Eventually, I'm dropping something this week. I have I have something in mind. I just have not had time to do it yet, but if you're not, patrons, it's coming your way. And definitely shout out to all our amazing patrons that have their own section on the website. That's how cool they are. Also, check out the blog section where we have reviews dropping left and right. Friends of the show, which is under the classified section, such as Nerd Initiative, Dragon Master Games, and the one and only 3FN podcast, killing it right now. Yeah. If you haven't been checking out their latest episodes, they have been really taking the deep dives on movies that you absolutely need to check out and out you know definitely make sure you're dropping them a subscribe and follow as well also pad how many providers are on because we have a whole directory section that has them uh we do we are on 101,633 i don't question him because he is a statistician to the stars also remember check out the music section of the show where you can check out such great musicians as brian wolf and the howlers doing big things down in austin texas Second suitor, Tom Jolo, who you hear every week on Turn a Page on Nerd Initiative YouTube. Uh, shout out the robots, Floodlands, the list goes on and on and on. We are so lucky to have everybody donate their music. So we definitely encourage you to go download their stuff and become fans of them like we are because, you know, hey, it works out that way. And for anything and everything that is the ODPH that I might have forgotten, well, it's at odphpodcast.com. And if you're using hashtags on social media, except for threads right now, make sure you use the hashtag ODPHpod. Threads is a whole different ballgame. Yes. So we definitely want to make sure until they allow more than one hashtag, you know, uh, hold off on there. But definitely use threads, though. We are picking up a lot of steam there as well. But enough about that. Let's get into what you tuned in for. And that is a take a look at the world of sports. Mm-hmm. And this week is a little bittersweet moment, I have to say. Yeah. Because it is the kickoff of the Major League Baseball season. Yes. This in North America always reminds us that spring is here. Summer's coming. Summer's on the way. Put away the uh, hat and boots. Mm -hmm. And the formerly known, and at least in our opinions, as America's pastime is in full swing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the NFL has surpassed it by leaps and bounds over recent years. Yes. To put it mildly. But baseball is still baseball. And it does remind us all about the timeless game that we have all grown up with. Mm Mm-hmm. And we were going to do a little season preview, but unfortunately, (laughs) a situation has happened that we have to give our opinions on based on the facts that we know about. Mm -hmm. And I want to stress that because I hate starting off a season like this Mm -hmm. or a preview, if you will. But my God, man, I saw this and I know you were sending it to me as well. Yep. And I'm just going, really? Yeah. In -hmm. this day and age? Yep. This? Yep. Pad, what are we talking about? We are, of course, talking about the ongoing uh, situations surrounding the allegations, and we have to stress that right now they are still allegations because there are three investigations going on surrounding this, uh, surrounding Shohei Otani and his now former interpreter, uh, uh, Ipe Mizuhara. Yeah, this is a very, very messy situation. And convoluted. Yeah, Because news broke about this. About a week ago. About a week ago. And it was like, wait, what? Yeah, that was my reaction. Because what has the accusations been? So 
to wind this back a little bit, you know, this first started developing because the thing we have to stress and the thing we have to make known is in the state of California, sports gambling is not legal Mm -hmm. yet. Right. I'm sure it will be at some point, but as of right now, as of this recording, you cannot legally bet on sports in the state of California. Correct. So somehow or another, the federal government, the FBI, got tipped off to an illegal gambling ring that was taking place in the state of California. And while they were doing their research and looking into this and and pulling at all the threads and all the strings surrounding this whole scenario, uh, Shohei Otani's name came up because they started looking through bank transfers and, and whose name was on what. And when it came into regards of the person who I guess you could say is one of the centerpieces of all of this, the bookie, uh, they saw on his wire transfers Shohei Otani's name listed on the wire transfers. Mm-hmm. So reporters started finding out about this and picking up on them. The way I've read it is they've known about this and have been working on stories about this since January. Mm. Specific dates, I don't know, but that's the one date I've heard consistently over the last week or so is, you know, the reporters have heard about this and and been working on stuff since January. My understanding is, and this is according to uh, Ken Rosenthal, uh, according to Ken Rosenthal, Major League Baseball did not find out about this until last week, which is frankly quite astounding. Uh, but so they started doing So the FBI is looking into this gambling ring out in California. They, they're looking at the bank statements of this bookie and they see Shohei Otani's name in there and they see it for multiple wire transfers of $500,000 in total. It was like 4.5 or $4.9 million mm-hmm. so somewhere in that neighborhood. Right. So the reporters are finding out about this. The reporters are working on their story because this isn't just a story that like you can you know, write a start, middle, and end, you know, hi, how you doing? Here's the details. All right, goodbye. You you know, you got to do your journalistic integrity on this because you're essentially putting your livelihood on the line if you get this wrong. Mm-hmm. So they're doing their business. They're doing their livelihood. And then a meeting and an interview gets set up between uh, Tisha Thompson at ESPN mm-hmm. and Ipe Mizuhara, who is uh, Shohei Otani's translator, his best friend, You know, they are 24-7, 365 with each other. It was even reported that, remember a couple years ago, there was the brief baseball lockout? Yeah. He technically, under that lockout, because Otani was a player, Ipe was an employee of of the club, technically couldn't see each other and interact with each other because the lockout was going on. The when he when the he was with the Angels. The Angels fired Ipe, quote unquote so that they could continue to see each other and hang out with each other. And once the lockout was over, they rehired him back in the same position. Hmm. That's how close these guys are. <clears throat> so an interview was set up between Ipe Mizuhara and Tisha Thompson at ESPN that lasted 90 minutes. Yo. And basically like, hey, what's going on? You know, and, and basically what it came down to is Ipe told ESPN that yeah, I'm I'm a horrible gambler. I owed four point five million dollars to this bookie, you know, for gambling. He he maintained he did not bet on baseball. That he bet on you know the NFL, soccer, college football, and and NBA and what have you. But he he made he said he did not bet on baseball. Mm-hmm. So that, that that was his initial story. Is he got in debt to this bookie, you know, four plus million dollars. And that uh, Shohei loaned him the money to cover the bills. Mm-hmm. ESPN's getting ready to publish this story. And then the Dodgers come around and turn out, turn around and go, no, 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 no. That's not what happened. This, this report is fraudulent. This report is false. You know, Ipe didn't, uh, didn't get the money loaned from Shohei Otani. Ipe stole the money from Shohei Otani. Hmm. And and Otani flipped back and forth between you know he, he initially didn't say anything, and then it came out that oh yeah no I had I had no idea what was going on, you know I I had this money stolen from me I never knew about any of this, so as of course now you've got in, in the days that led up since that, you know, people started digging through 
everything about eBay because he changed his story about four different times. Right. And one of the things that came out was back in 2019 in the Angels Media Guide. Now, this is something that you and I can't buy, but this is something they give out to like the writers and the broadcasters. Sure. Uh, in case they're giving a little bit of commentary or background on players, managers, coaches, whatever. So the, the media guide for Ipe from 2019 reads, quote, Ipe Mizuhara is in his second season with the Angels as an interpreter. Born in Konai, Japan, he grew up in Diamond Bar, California, attending Diamond Bar High School and graduating from the University of California, Riverside, in 2007. Mizuhara served as an interpreter for Hideki Okajima during Yankee spring training in 2012 before joining Nippon Ham Fighters in 2013 to translate for English-speaking players. In his five seasons with the Fighters, he worked with several players to also appear in the majors, including Jeremy Hermida, Chris Martin, Mika uh, Hoffpower, Anthony Bass, and Luis Mendoza. Ipe and his wife Naomi were married in July, uh, married on July seventeenth, two thousand eighteen, and reside in Tokyo in the off season. Close quote. So, of course, this is all going on. People start digging into, uh, you know, the background on Ipe because, hey, how did this happen? You know, whether it's he stole the money or Shohei loaned him the money. If he stole the money, how did he get a hold of his finances? What's this guy's story? You, uh, you, University of California Riverside comes out and says, yeah, we've got no records of this guy ever attending our school. Mm. And then the story about Hideki Okajima, one, he never made it onto the Yankees spring training crew. And even when he was with the Boston, he, he tried claiming he was with the ball, worked for the Boston Red Sox. The Boston Red Sox came out and said, yeah, no, we never hired this guy. So now you've got a, a habitual liar because what what do you believe? Any can you believe anything he says? Right. So now we're at the crux where yesterday, as we record, it was known going into the day that Shohei Otani was going to uh, speak to the media, and everyone was real curious. <laughs> My understanding is LA traffic normally bad. Uh, LA traffic getting to Dodger Stadium was even worse because, understandably. Every media outlet in the area and in the country between U.S., Japan, and overseas wanted to be there for this thing. Mm. He spoke to the media actually a lot longer than I thought he would. You know, I figured he'd just read a quick statement because I didn't expect him to say anything. And I and here's the thing I would say. I wouldn't expect anything to resolve from this anytime soon because Major League Baseball, yes, they are. They This came down. Almost a week ago, it wasn't until the Friday news dump. You know how like uh, corporations or like news stations like to dump a news at like four thirty on a Friday because nobody will see it because they're getting ready to leave for the weekend. Yeah, the allegedly there. Yeah, the allegedly. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Major League Baseball did the same thing where it was like four thirty, five o'clock on Friday. They're like, oh hey, by the way, uh, we're doing an investigation into Shohei Otani. So they're doing theirs, but they're obviously going to wait because the FBI is in- investigating the gambling ring that's going on mm-hmm. which Shohei's name is attached to because ESPN has for according to reports has seen the wire transfers you know totaling multiple uh wire transfers of $500,000 with Shohei's name on them and uh, and according to one report I saw uh and, and we, you know how like you write a check and you might put what it's for in the bottom left corner mm-hmm. that the in this wire transfer it said loan so the ESPN's seen this. Shohei's name is attached to. So you've got the so you've got Major League Baseball investigating this. You've got the FBI investigating this. And now because we're dealing with potential fraud and potential forgery, if this is a case where and again this is all allegedly we we don't until the investigation plays out and maybe this gets put in front of a court of law. Well, you know we don't know for a hundred percent certainty. Uh, but now because you've got forgery and potential wire fraud uh involved with this the irs is involved and for mm. the and, and if you for those of our international listeners overseas they're called the internal revenue system they're the ones that handle taxes and involve and basically deal with money uh if you want to know how uh versatile i guess you could say they can be with uh, their investigation abilities and how good they are look up the story of what happened to al capone mm-hmm Al Capone back in what was it the 20s or 30s in Chicago, nigh untouchable. Even even the police force was reportedly allegedly on his side during those times, uh, and the only people that could bring him down were the IRS. So this is where we're at. Shohei Otani was out 4.5 plus million dollars. Either knew it and was covering for his buddy, or didn't know it and was really careless. 
and uh, Ipe Muzahara fumbled the bag. I mean, let's be honest. You got you got a pretty solid job translating for a dude who's about to make a billion dollars. Uh, and we have no idea who's telling the truth. Yeah, I mean, it is a little messy about it, too. And, and you know, like I say, I thought Otani at the, the press conference, I, I applaud him about this. I do, too. Because, let's face it, when you are literally the new face of baseball. The biggest name on the planet. Yeah. Who, I mean, he just signed this year, leaving the uh, Angels to yep. go to the Dodgers, 10-year, $700 million contract. Yep. Yeah, and obviously he has grown into that superstar position in the yeah. game, and and he is most recognized as the face of baseball. He's the modern Babe Ruth. We have yeah. not, we have not seen a pit, a pitcher be able to hit like he can. We've mm. we've seen some pitchers hit some sure. hit some home runs. High Bartolo Colon for one, right? But in terms of hitting him like he does, and I'm not talking like the height or the distance or just just the fact he hit like 40, 50 home runs or whatever the hell it was the last couple of years. We've never seen a pitcher in our lifetimes do that. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely insane to see it. So yeah. to see him connected to this, mm-hmm. it really overshadows the start of the season. And and this is a guy who is normally very private. Yeah, you know, very under the radar. Very under the radar. We didn't find you know he's been in the league you know five six seven years. I'll have to look it up. Whatever it is, mm-hmm. we didn't find out till recently he got a dog. You know, and he was like, oh, yeah, I got a dog. He decided on the trip over, but right before he went to Seoul, because the Major League Baseball season technically opened a couple days ago in Seoul between the Padres and the Dodgers. We didn't find out until then. He made a casual uh, Instagram post. It was like a, t- it was one of those like typed up text responses that got shared to Instagram. He's like, sure. oh, he's like, oh, hey, by the way, I got, I got married. You know, it's, she's a very lovely woman, you know, and basically it was like, Oh, she's not. She's nothing real crazy. It's just a nice woman. Yeah, come to find out, it's one of the bigger and uh, basketball players over in Japan. Mm-hmm. Like this is a very closeted dude. That up until this point, you've never really heard anything bad about the guy. No, you know he's he's fun. He's he's good to hang around with. He laughs. He pals around. Whatever else. Supposedly, he knows a little bit of Spanish, and that really throws some uh fielders for a loop when they meet him for the first time and they didn't know he could speak Spanish. Yeah. You know, this is kind of the first, you know, black eye, I guess you could say, on the guy. Yeah, I mean, this is just one of the situations that when you're at that kind of level mm-hmm. and, and you're the face of the game. Yeah. That you're the franchise player right now. Yeah. And you have controversy on this level surrounding you. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's one thing when you sign the biggest contract in the sports history. Yep. 10 years, 700 million to put in perspective, like that's a lot and with bonuses. Money. Yeah. With bonuses, Lord, I mean, Lord, you're pushing near a billion. Uh, if, if I'm doing my math, right. I'll look it up and I'm pretty sure, but to have you connected to a situation like this, right. Is huge and not for the good reasons. To be investigated on this level and knowing that baseball especially Mm -hmm. has had a very bad history (laughs) with gambling. Yep. Throughout the years. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, and and baseball's not alone. NBA had Tim Tim Donahue. You know, the NFL, uh, Calvin Ridley, most most note recently. Right, but let's face it. I mean, since... Nothing to this level, though. Right, to this level, no. I mean, they've had unfortunate incidents with the Chicago White Sox way back way when. Way back when, yep. You know, and then Pete, Pete Rose, Rose, especially. Yeah. So, to see Otani connected to this... In some capacity. in Yeah, in some capacity is shocking. Uh-huh. Is frightening yeah. to a certain degree that... With everything that has gone on in pro sports and gambling mm-hmm. over the years, mm-hmm. and like you touched upon with the NBA with Tim Donahue, and and I mean obviously with football and the NFL yeah. most recently, we've seen players getting in trouble with that. To see it happening in this day and age, yeah, is astounding to me. Oh, it might me too. But to see the biggest star of a league connected to this mm-hmm. whether he's involved or not he's still connected yeah because of the his his friend who is the interpreter yeah and if otani didn't know about it because if the friend was saying hey could i get you know x amount of money for whatever like hey i owe a lot of money to these these let's just say loan sharks mm-hmm. you know what i owe a lot of money to these loan sharks if if, if i don't pay them up they're gonna kill me 
Like, I, if that's the case, I totally understand it. Well, that's an extreme case, but it could be something like, hey, I want to go get a new car. Or, right. Or you could right. Like, do something like that. And when you're in a position like that, I could see, I mean, let's face it. If you have that money and you can spend it like that and right. you know, Tani, you know, if he cares about his friends and does it like, and doesn't pay attention to it, right. that's on him. Like, seriously, he right. could do it. We've seen this happen with other athletes. Yeah. That, you know, when and bad investments and, and or had family members or relatives or friends, you know, just steal tons of money from them. Because let's face it, there are some athletes who are really, you know, weird and, and pay attention to all their finances and they got a pretty good idea what they got and they jot it down and they got a book or a spreadsheet, whatever. But then there are guys who they just don't care. They uh, they just hand it out and they'll worry about it or they pay somebody to worry mm. about it. Yeah. So in this situation, somebody fumbled the bag seriously. Right. I don't necessarily know if it's Otani. Right. That, that well, that's the thing we don't know. We know his name is attached to this right. because the wire transfers are there. The wire transfers were there enough for the feds to start looking into it and for the the writers to start picking up on it. ES like I said, ESPN has seen the wire transfers. Mm-hmm. And Otani's name is on the wire transfers. Now, whether he signed it or not, we don't know. You know, so all we know is his name is involved to this in some capacity. This, you know, whether he knows or not, I don't know. I'm, I'm Lee. I hope he doesn't. I hope it's a case where he doesn't know, mm-hmm. you know, but if it, it also would surprise me if he did know was covering for his friend and then didn't fully grasp the situation of how bad this was, because there are rules in major league baseball against gambling. You can gamble on sports, not baseball mm-hmm. where it is legal. Yeah. But you cannot gamble on sports, not baseball, where it is not legal. Mm-hmm. And it would not surprise me if he did not know this, although because it's supposed to be posted in every clubhouse, the home and visitor, that you're not supposed to gamble on on baseball and the rules about it. But the way I understood it and the way it was uh, said, uh, I believe it was uh, Ken Rosenthal was talking about this, is it's posted on a sheet of paper in English, and in Spanish. Mm. Reportedly, it's not posted in Japanese, which that could be a whole out, but you know, we'll let that play out in the court of law. You know, but so I hope it's a case of he he didn't know what he was doing in, in that he was breaking some rules. He was committing potential, wire, you know, whatever else with wire fraud and all this other stuff that he was just trying to help a friend. Mm-hmm. That, is, that his best friend in the world came to him and said, hey, I'm in debt a lot of money to these guys. Can you help me out? Yeah. And his, he went, absolutely. Because let's face it, there was a report that came out a couple of days or maybe a week before this in in uh, merchandise and in, uh, what is it, uh, promotions or whatever you want to call it, alone. Otani's making like 60-something million this year. He's got, he's good. He's got the money. So, you know, for, for Ipe to come to Shohei and say, hey, I need I need a couple million to cover some some gambling debts. I'm in bad. I can I can see as close as they reportedly were, and I don't think they're that close anymore. Uh, I can see that being the case, but at the same token, with you know the the book he turning around and the story being that he was using Shohei's name, saying hey Shohei gambles with me to increase his uh, user base. I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. You know, between the the bookie lying in between Ipe changing his story four times, it also wouldn't surprise me if Shohei was involved in this. I mean, that's just what we're going to have to wait to see and and watch unfold. Like I say, my gut instinct right now, like I'm just my opinion. I I do not have any facts. We do not know. No, we want to stress this too. My opinion right now is Otani didn't know about it. Okay. And I think the fact that he got up there and addressed the media for as long as he did, right? that's the telling point. Because yeah. if he really knew something about it, yeah, I feel that he would have got caught saying something and yeah. slipping. No, and I, I, feel, I feel the same way just because as somebody who used to lie a lot to his parents growing up, bad grades, you know, other things of the like. When I was trying to hide the truth from them, I would come up with any way, shape, or form to distract them from finding out the Mm -hmm. truth. When I was open and honest and had nothing to hide, I was an open goddamn book. Yeah. The fact that I expected Otani to get up there and go, 
This is an ongoing legal matter. I've been advised by counsel mm-hmm. to not to not comment. I'm focused on the season and performing well with my teammates. Yeah, gone. But the fact that he he sat up there for twelve or thirteen minutes, gave a long and lengthy response, lends me to believe he didn't know what was going on. That that he's he's in the clear. Yeah, to that degree. Right. Like I say, I think it all centers around the interpreter. Right. I think, unfortunately, the amount of times as it stands right now that the story has flipped. Yeah. That is casting a public opinion. Yeah. That you're the problem. Yeah. Well, and I know the other thing, too, some people are wondering, well, you know, if it was a case that he stole money, how did he have access to the to the bank accounts? And there's been a couple of, you know, interpreters over the years who've, who've come out and said that like hey you know this isn't you know something that's that's very out of out of the ordinary there was uh, one interpreter daniel kim he was an interpreter for two different major league baseball teams mm-hmm. uh he said quote when i worked as an interpreter i had to assist the the players on just about every aspect of their daily lives these include opening bank accounts taking them to the DMV to get licenses, and setting up utilities. I also carried their checkbooks on the road for clubhouse dues. Close quote. Yeah. So I know some people are going, well, how the hell did he get a hold of Shohei's bank accounts? And, and to me, I, 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 at first I wondered that myself because that seems oddly suspicious. Mm-hmm. But learning that, that basically, and learning over the couple of days that these interpreters are basically babysitters yeah, and they, and they take care of these guys 24-7, 365 while they're getting acclimated to a whole new country, a whole new language, and a whole new way of life, mm-hmm. lets, lets me sit there and go, okay, you know what? That, that starts to make a little bit of sense. Yeah, no, that's what I say. I, I think it all centers around the interpreter, in my opinion. Sure. I think, you know, depending on how much access he had and how much he was on the up and up with right. with Otani, I think that's what's all going to ultimately come out and play out. Right, and I mean, the other thing we don't know, too, is, you know, who else was involved with his financials? Did he have a financial advisor? Mm-hmm. Was there somebody? Somebody like him, I can imagine... There's like some an entire division of folks who are just devoted to him at whatever bank he goes through. But like the fact that none of this, because this didn't take place over the course of a week or a couple of days, this was a little lengthy, not years, but a couple of months that right. this, this was going on. This net, like if he's got a financial advisor or somebody that takes care of his money, that basically when it comes time to, to, maybe monthly or yearly when it comes time for taxes goes, all right, Hey, here's what you made. Here's what you paid. Here's what you're going to get that, you know, just takes care of everything on the back end. That like, if he's got something like that, they never caught it. That the the fact that $500,000 was being wired repeatedly and the bank never caught it. Like there's other stuff on the end of this. And I'm kind of sitting here wondering how did this fall apart? Because I feel like something should have caught somewhere along the way. Well, it might have. I mean, obviously, when you're talking about doing tax time, yeah, that might have been. Yeah, what, that might have been what triggered everything. That could be. You have to kind of really look at the the big picture right now. But what it all centers around right now is Otani is going to have this lingering around him. Yeah, and the organization. And the Dodgers are already one of the more popular teams to have on TV, mm-hmm. especially with him being on the team this year and them adding Yamamoto from the Japan League over there. Yeah. This is not going to shrink the uh, media pool size any over the course of the year. No, and especially he plays in the second biggest media market on the planet outside uh-huh. of New York. Uh huh. This is going to be a problem for, like I say, not only him, the organization, and the sport itself. Yeah. Because we have to take a look, just super briefly, you take a look at everything that's gone on with the steroid scandal, yep. strikes, and yep. all this. Yep. Baseball has declined in my opinion from popularity in comparison to other sports yeah because of stuff like this yeah so now when you start getting some momentum back right because they were as of last year if you just look at ratings ratings were up not huge numbers no but but they were up they were up yeah the fans were starting to come back but now when you have your biggest star connected to something like this Mm -hmm. this is a problem baseball's best hope for this is that you know, he didn't know or didn't know the full truth of what was going on mm-hmm. and, and is scot-free from this. The worst case example is he knew or or not even he knew it was he was participating in this. Yeah. That Ipe was just the middleman. Yeah. Which if that's the case and that comes to light. Oh. 
uh, you're going to see one of the biggest fall from graces. There's already precedent for it. Yeah. That in, in this modern era, I don't think we've ever seen. Because now and this now this that and if he if he participated in it, th- whatever happens after that then comes down to what did he bet on? Because the, the rules in baseball are, well, we know if you bet on baseball, what happens? Mm-hmm. The, but what we don't know, because I don't think it's ever happened, or at least not in the modern era, is according to the rules, if you get caught gambling on other sports, your punishment is up to the discretion of the commissioner. Yeah. And to that, there, to my knowledge, and hashtag ODPHPod, if you can think of something, to my knowledge, there is no precedent for that. Because nobody's ever really done it, or if they have, they've never gotten caught. Well, that's the thing because I was going to say the Pete Rose scandal, but that was after he was, he was gone. That was after he. Well, that was while he was manager, and he was right. bet, he was betting on baseball. He was betting on games he managed. Right. So I mean, like I say, this yeah, this is uncharted water. And 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 Ipe is in is maintaining he didn't bet on baseball, but whether I believe that or not, I want to just stress the dude changed his story four times. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I I don't know. Yeah, it's going to be a question, but I guess we can kind of just wrap it up with this. I mean, if he's guilty. And we stress if what happens to Otani? Oh, uh, probably if if Otani's guilty, depending on what it is. Um, if if he's guilty and he participated in it, uh, he'll probably be suspended for, I would say, upwards of a year. You mm-hmm. know, I, I could see, I could see, you know, a hundred hundred and twenty games, whatever it ends up being. You know, if it's obviously he bet on baseball, he's done. Yeah. You know, if it comes out through, because the feds aren't going to play cute with this. I listen. I well, I love no, baseball. No, no way. I love baseball and all this, but if this was just Major League Baseball investigating this, they would sweep this under the rug so fast your head would spin. Mm-hmm. But the feds are investigating this; they're not going to care what comes out on the other end of this. They want to get to the bottom of this, and the, and so does the IRS. Yeah, the fact they're involved. Yeah. It, so, but if it so if it comes out that Otani bet on baseball, he's done. Mm-hmm. He will. He will be. You know, the contract will be voided, you know, and, and the Dodgers will not have $700 million sitting in their pocket burning a hole, you know. But if he just didn't bet on baseball, he bet on other sports, well, then he'll be, I'd say, probably a year. He'll mm-hmm. be he'll be suspended. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, like, this is going to be a court case we're going to have to follow. And I, and, yeah. I, and I hate saying that with sports. Yeah. I really do. But this is going to be a investigation like we've never seen. Yeah. Because with the level that Otani is at, uh-huh, and the ramifications involving him that the FBI and powers of be are going to take their time. The only thing I think close to what we've seen was the Balco stuff, you know. And that's yeah, 20 but, years ago, but that was pretty clear cut and dry. Right. So that's that's why I say but and in, in when in, it In terms of this there's so much gray area. Yeah, that's the whole thing. They're like this is such uncharted uh, uncharted water. Yeah. That we have to sit back and watch and let the case play out. So, like I said, we give the opinions of what we had at, as of right now. We don't know facts other than what, right. has been re- what has been reported. Right. But we are going to have to watch this moving forward mm-hmm. because this is going to be a case that really is going to redefine sports and right. gambling. Yeah. And... This is going to be a landmark case uh-huh. that is going to be used in reference for years to come. Yeah. And it's wild to say that we're in this day and age, and I'm not trying to over over sensationalize it. It's just I don't know if people understand the gravity around this. I mean, if you're not an NBA or an MLB fan, you know, let's just say you're an NFL fan, this would be the equivalent of like a Patrick Mahomes, Brady in his day, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other big stars. Travis Kelsey, you know, it's like them coming out and they gambled on the NFL or they gambled illegally. Oh, you yeah. know, if in the NBA, it's like if LeBron James mm-hmm. or, or you know, LeBron James or like a Russell Westbrook or, you know, like a Luka Doncic yeah. or something did that in the in the NHL. It's like if Sidney Crosby or Ovechkin or Austin Matthews or one of those guys gambled on sports. You know, just take whatever sport you are a fan of. Mm-hmm. Pick the biggest athlete or athletes, and then imagine how you would react or, and what the reaction would be if it came out that they were gambling illegally. Yeah. It's wild to say this all is happening but right before opening day, but yeah. this is going to be something that, unfortunately, we are going to have looming over the season mm-hmm. moving forward. Yeah. 
I mean, I know we were set to talk about opening day, Pat. If you got anything you want to kind of kick in about it, to, yeah, I mean, to just some end on a high note, and on some high notes, there are some uh, potential milestone moments we might see. Well, some of these uh, we will fucking see this year. Uh, but in 2024, Aaron Judge, of course, the outfielder of the Yankees, he is 43 home runs away from 300. Wow. So, so, hey, could see that this year. Listen, the one year he hit 60 and the one year he hit 50 really help. Uh, Juan Soto is 29 walks away from most all-time by a player under 26 years old. As long as he walks towards that contract for an extension with the Yankees, that's all that matters. So. Absolutely. Uh, Spencer Strider of the uh, Atlanta Braves is 17 strikeouts away from 500 strikeouts. Corbin Burns of the Baltimore Orioles is 130 strikeouts from 1,000 strikeouts. So these are all going to happen. It's just a matter of when. Mm -hmm. Uh, Clayton Kershaw is 56 strikeouts from 3,000. Wow. Crazy. Uh, And then Mike Trout is 32 home runs away from 400 home runs. It's insane to think about, and that's the stories we should be talking about. Yeah, we've got some great games going on. Technically, the season's already started, although that was, you know, two games over in South Korea, Mm -hmm. you know, at 3 in the morning, one time zone, 6 a.m. and other time zone. Uh, But Thursday, you've got the Brewers taking on the Mets, Angels taking on the Orioles, Braves taking on the uh, Phillies, Tigers taking on the White Sox. Twins taking on the uh, Royals. Yankees taking on the Astros. Fuck them. Uh, the Pirates taking on the Marlins. Giants taking on the Padres. Cardinals taking on the Dodgers. Uh, Blue Jays taking on the Rays. Uh, Nationals taking on the Reds. Cubs taking on the Rangers. Guardians taking on the uh, Athletics. And then the Red Sox taking on the Mariners. And lastly, and certainly not leastly, the Colorado Rockies taking on the Arizona Diamondbacks. This is all going down Thursday. Thursday. Uh, check your local listings what time those games take place. Yeah. So. It starts at like 1 in the afternoon, and it goes all the way till 10 o'clock. Yeah, I was going to say, the time-honored tradition kicks off yeah. opening day baseball, which that's what we should be focusing on. But unfortunately, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. things are happening, folks. Yeah, oh, That's yeah. the easiest and most polite way we can put it. So hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPagePod. Shoei Otani. What's your take right now on the situation? Like I say, there's a lot of allegedly is going on right now. That's where we stand with this. And just to emphasize, like I say, we have gone off what the facts have said. We have given our opinions. We don't know anything specifically. This, uh, we said in this part of segment what we knew as of recording. So if you're listening to this in the future, yes. well, they didn't mention X, Y, or Z because, hey, it, it hadn't happened yet. Check the timestamp. Or things changed. Mm-hmm. So definitely as we record right now, this is what we know. This is our interpretation of it. This is our thoughts, but we want to definitely hear yours. And how is your team looking going into the season? Definitely we can have that conversation yeah. on social media. Definitely want to hear everybody's teams. Obviously, you know we're big Yankee fans here Absolutely. at the show. Uh, so we'll be talking about that throughout the season. But let us know how your team is doing unless you're Houston because Pat does not want to hear it. Fuck you. <laughs> He's being honest, folks, and I, and I have to echo those statements. So definitely hit us up. Let us know what you're thinking about the baseball season kicking off this year for 2024. But we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Do not adjust your dial or, well, your phone your watch or whatever the heck you're using to listen to the awesome podcast you're currently listening to. I am the Duke of Nerds, Tyler Mack, and I am here to tell you that being a nerd can be a bit overwhelming, especially after 30. Life moves pretty fast in our nerd culture, and if you don't take the time to notice things, you miss out. That's why I'm here. As your Duke of Nerds, I am charged with educating and enlightening and entertaining you on all things nerdy. I do it by running the 30 and Nerdy podcast. 30 and Nerdy is a bad cast company production and currently playing wherever you cast your pod. Follow along each episode using the hashtag 30andnerdypod. And check out what all is going on at 30andnerdypodcast.com. Whether it's DC, Marvel, comics, or video games, I have got you covered. So tune in now. Cheers to you, nerds. Kilman back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast. And this week was a loaded one for the WWE. Yeah, it was. WrestleMania is just around the corner. Yes. And we had this date circled on our calendar because Monday Night Raw was returning where, Pad? Uh, to Chicago, specifically the Allstate Arena. Right. Uh, where, what was it? That, they said the exact datage on, on Monday Night Raw. We're like, however many months earlier to the day. 
CM Punk made his shocking return to WWE in that same building. Mm -hmm. Weird how that works. It's weird how it works, but it was all timed out like it's all connected. Mm -hmm. And it was because for this recap, we are going to be breaking down the return of CM Punk to Monday Night Raw Uh and WWE television, obviously injuring himself at the Royal Rumble. Yeah. Throwing a little mix into the plans for WrestleMania because obviously he was scheduled to be a big part of it. Yes. And to see him come back, it was one of the most anticipated shows of the weekend. And this is coming off a strong SmackDown where they've been doing a decent build for Cody versus Roman. Hashtag finish the story. I mean, it's been okay. It's It, was, it, it might crack top 10. Yeah, I would say <laughs> it, it, it's it's <laughs> definitely up there. But when you involve one Dwayne The Rock Johnson, yeah, Hollywood's biggest action star yeah. in the mix, yeah. it yeah. definitely helps matters. A lot of people are talking about the show. About the only thing missing from Rock being there is beating his opponents with some of his own merch. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking Zoa and that skincare line he's just started. Give it time. We still have a couple shows before. That's true. Fuck. Yeah, we still have some time for that. But as we break down the show, I mean, obviously, everybody was really geared up for the CM Punk promo that Mm -hmm, happened. mm -hmm. It didn't open up the show, which I was was not super surprised at. I'll be honest. I was hoping, and I threw this uh, idea out to a buddy of ours, where... Because Drew McIntyre has been the ultimate uh, shit poster on the internet. The he web. has been fantastic. Holy hell, if you haven't seen the video of him at Mindy's um, Bakery, you'll see what I mean. Uh, but no, I threw out the idea that, like, listen, we know Punk's going to be there. Open the show with Cult of Personality. Let it let it linger. And then, oh, wait a minute. It's not CM Punk. It's Drew McIntyre. Yeah. Ultimate heel heat. But now we got Cody to start the show. No, Cody came out obviously addressing what was going on Monday night or mm-hmm. Friday night, I should say. Yep. And that was the whole he was coming to SmackDown alone and going to confront Roman. And yep. then it got a little messy. Yeah. Because obviously Jey Uso and, and Seth Rollins came in the mix along mm-hmm. with Jimmy Uso and mm-hmm. Solo Sokoa. Mm-hmm. So they did really kind of play it off about like, okay, what was going to happen? And, and Cody gave this very impassioned speech about yep. finishing the story again. And he was going to make, you know, he wasn't going to get screwed over. He was going to make this the time to finally finish. And then somebody crashed the party uh-huh. that we were not expecting. Well, I mean, I I, was, I wasn't surprised because I remembered that they had announced uh, he was going to be showing up on Raw. I just didn't pay attention to when it was. See, I, I thought it was going to be last night. And everyone's like, oh, my God, we didn't expect him to be here. I'm like, yeah, we did. I was like, he, was, he announced he was coming back. No, he was announced for the Brooklyn one next week. Which I totally missed the aspect of them saying Brooklyn. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. but was, Like, the moment happened, and I'm like, why is everyone freaking out? We knew this. Mm-hmm. And then they said, I'm like, oh, okay. And then suddenly The Rock appeared. Which... Holy hell, can we talk about their their presentation and their camera work? Absolutely. Because, listen, no disrespect to Kevin Dunn. You did a lot of work over the years, good, bad, and otherwise. But the best thing to happen to WWE in the last 10 years uh, pr- on the production side of things has been his leaving the company. My God, that shot with Rock coming out and he's standing on the entryway mm. and his Titan Tron or whatever you want to call it, it's going off behind him. And it's like a wide shot. And you got Cody standing in there in the middle with like the singular light on him, and the Rock just off his one his one shoulder. You could st- you could see the two in the same shot, and the Rock standing there waiting. Oh my God, I need that framed. Yeah, no, that was iconic. The one thing they've done, and I'm, <clears throat> and I'm glad you brought that up, is the production work has really taken a change since God, Kevin the, Dunn left. The the one shot long camera where they go to follow the wrestler like through Gorilla, yeah. into the back. Oh my God, brilliant. I Absolutely love it. brilliant. Love it. And the one thing too, which I don't know if a lot of people picked up on last night, the Titan Tron screen, yeah, was shorter. It was. I, well, I think they went with because it's in the same building the uh, Survivor Series was. I think they went with a similar setup because they knew Punk was going to be there. Let's pack the house. Oh, absolutely. But you know what? I think moving forward. They should do that. I I agree with that. Because Listen, I love the giant screen with the giant graphics and the giant everything. But like, I like I dig the smaller look. Yeah, and it didn't take anything away from no, the production. Like that was no. the, that was the key thing. Like if they kept the the big screen for SmackDown, I'd be okay with sure. it. Sure, but for Raw, I think it works better. Do I need to see Drew McIntyre's uh, name in like size three hundred and twenty five font? No, no. Does it is it still effective with what they had last night? Yes. Oh yeah, I mean that's why I say because everybody's invested about the story, so you yeah. don't, you don't need that much. The less is more approach, and when they did that shot with the Rock. 
That's what really stood out. And he just mm-hmm. came to the ring. He whispered something to Cody and then left. The man pulled a Chris Jericho. Yeah. Showed up, said nothing, left. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And that was the that set the benchmark for the show. And 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 then kept the entry going because Jackie Redman backstage caught up with The Rock as he was getting ready to quote unquote leave and said, Hey, well, listen, the world's wondering. What did you say to Cody? And he goes, eh, well, uh, in regards to that, you're going to have to ask Cody himself. Mm-hmm. And then went to find Cody a little later in the night. And Cody's like, oh, yeah, the, he, he wanted to keep that between himself and uh, Dwayne. Yeah. So they definitely built up a, an interesting dynamic to the story yeah. for the show. But then it really got down to business about 9 o'clock, and that was the midway point. That's what we were all waiting on. Yep. And that is when CM Punk hit the ring. Yep. And came out to a hero's welcome in Chicago again. Oof. Uh, it's the crowd was definitely lit, lit up for him. They were feeling it. Yeah. Which I mean, obviously that's his home turf Yeah, and he, it, this is nothing home new field advantage. Yeah. And obviously if he's going to come out and we haven't seen him in a while, this is a perfect place to do it. Mm-hmm. He got in the ring mm-hmm. and went vintage punk. Yeah, he did. And Holy if, shit. And if anybody was questioning about why, you know, he was such a big deal to come back to WWE, it's this reaction right here Uh huh. that love him or hate him. He's good at what he does. Yeah. He's great at what he does, I should yeah, say. Yeah, he's real good on the mic, too. Yeah, so like I say, he will draw ratings. He will get the crowd to react to him. He has the it factor. Mm-hmm. This is why it was so detrimental to lose him from AEW. Was I was on screen for what? Maybe like 12, 15, 20 minutes or so? Mm-hmm. Set up multiple storylines? Oh, yeah. You know, he's the, like, hey, Roman and I are going to cross paths at some point. Let's not mess that up. And, hey, Dwayne, maybe he learned a lesson from 10 years ago. Yeah, no, he definitely knew what he was doing in planting seeds. Uh Uh-huh. And he does it better than anybody. Yes, he does. And the one seed that we've all been waiting on, and I love how you touched upon it earlier too, Pad, Uh was Drew McIntyre. Yep. Who came out, and Drew right now, if you haven't been following him, his his heel work is on another level. Uh Uh-huh. And... If anybody's questioning if WWE is going to let him go, I think he's already re-signed. I think so, too. There's not a chance he's leaving uh, right now. He doesn't get this kind of freedom anywhere else. Right. And especially the reactions he's getting, like he's just taking it up another notch. And the interactions he had with Punk in the ring. Yep. It reminded me, and I, I made a tweet about this, and Pat, I want to get your take. Okay. This is like the Joker and Batman. Yes. Agreed. This was complete Heath Ledger and Christian Bale. Yes. Yes. And because what Drew is doing is Drew is saying, you complete me. He went full Joker on him. Yeah, he did. And just was expressing about the insanity part, which, I mean, Drew has now become so obsessed with CM Punk. And it's funny because what is when Drew and Seth are in the ring together, Mm -hmm. Drew has just been hammering home for weeks now, ever since the press conference in Vegas the week of the Super Bowl. He's been hammering home to Rollins like, listen, you're too focused on the bloodline. You're too focused on taking down Roman. You got to focus on me or else I'm going to beat you. But at the same token, Drew's as focused on Punk as Seth's focused on Roman. Because Drew's got the shirts with with the the Barry Allen, Stephen Amell meme, except it's CM Punk's name and it's Drew McIntyre's face doing the peace sign. He's the one who, like, oh, savior of WrestleMania and on the back, take out CM Punk, check mark. So, like, dude, don't throw stones at glass houses because you're just as focused. And they got brought up like, hey, listen, you got to focus here. Yeah. No, it was, it was brilliant about how the setup was here. Yeah. The only thing that I knew really drew a reaction more so <laughs> than I thought it was going to yeah. was there was a line by CM Punk. Uh-huh. And... When Drew is getting referred to as the chosen, chosen one, one, Punk goes. As soon as the chosen one was uttered with Punk in the ring, I went, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I knew where this was going. This got set up. Uh-huh. And Punk, Punk, goes, Punk, Punk had a line drive to right field. Yep. Who chose you? Who, cho- who, who, cho- who called you the chosen one? Go ahead. Say his name. Yeah. That was such an incredible on the fly. Drew almost broke. Oh, well, Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you can see him. He's like, oh, shit. I didn't expect that. No, he, he set that one up perfectly. Yeah. And it was one that really caught fans off guard. Uh huh. And me, I thought it was brilliant. Oh, it was amazing. I thought it was brilliant. I was like, there was no chance in hell, pun intended, that person's name was going to get said. Hell no. There's no chance. 
So Punk knew he had him there. Yeah. But you know what? To Drew's credit, and, well, this and goes, Punk, Punk was probably the opinion. What are they going to do? Suspend me? Oh yeah, well, I'm already out. Well, that's the whole thing. Punk knows he can get away with a lot, uh-huh. and I'm sure. I, I guarantee you this. I'm sure he ran the line by Triple H. Oh, and, I guarantee you. Yeah, yes, and Triple H is laughing all the way in the back there. Uh huh. Because let's face it, we know that person is no longer involved with the company. Correct. He's not going to get mentioned on TV. Nope. But people know who he is. Uh huh. And you can't if, if escape you know, it. If you know enough of the history, you know who it is. And even if you don't, you stick around on the internet long enough, somebody will explain it. Mm-hmm. So it made perfect sense to do it. Yep. And I thought it was I thought it was brilliant to say it because that's what Punk does is he walks that fine line of breaking kayfabe like mm-hmm. nobody else. Albeit though, Drew held his own. Yes, he did. Drew had some great punchlines in there. In fact, <laughs> he goes to he goes to sit on the commentary table. He's knocking over the monitors. He's knocking off the cover. The cameraman's coming around for a better shot, so he's not filming his back. And and Drew looks at the camera guys. Don't goes don't film up my skirt, you perv. Yeah, but I'm I sorry, thought, kilt. I th- I thought his best line though was you don't do drugs, you don't drink, but you spend all your time in rehab. Uh huh. And I, well, and I love how after Seth came out and this this was just brilliant between the three of them. Where Seth's like, listen, I think it's only right we have CM Punk involved in a match in our match at Mania in some capacity, and and there was a small part of me that was like, oh, is he going to pull a scene and be fucking ready, a uh, super ahead of schedule, and and get uh, throw out like, hey, you can be in the match if you're medically cleared, and then like night off, he's medically cleared, but no, they throw out like, oh, do you want him to ref? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, or no, they first asked if you want commentary, mm-hmm. you know, do you want him on commentary? And everyone, there was pretty uh, substantial cheers for that. And then the fans started chanting "Ref, Ref, Ref, Ref," and and Seth paused and went, "Guys, I don't know if you know, but that's his counting arm," and referring to the one he injured. Mm-hmm. Punk gets down on the ground with his good arm and counts one, two, three. I love McAfee went, "Oh, that's a quick count." Yeah, you know, but he got back up and then Seth was or uh, Punk was uh, honest and went, "You know." I don't know if I can be a ref. I don't. I don't think I can be impartial between these these two. Uh, I forget what. What did he say? He swore. He, oh, he, he drops a bomb there. He, he, he swore or something that they bleeped it out. And then without missing a beat, Drew picked up the mic and went PG, bro. Yep. Keep it PG. No, they kept it really interesting. And I think for a match that we've all, if we're diehard fans, we've been keeping track of. Yeah. But let's face it. It's not the marquee one of the night, but it's going to be a good one. Exactly. It's a main event. Yeah. It's just not the main event. Right. But still, I thought they did enough to get fans fully invested in it. Yeah. I think, you know, honestly, as weird as it might sound, the only person I thought came out bad in this was Seth Rollins. Eh, a little bit. Like, not... Not terrible. Not terrible, Cause, cause in he, comparison. Because, like I said, the one thing he's been hearing from Drew for weeks and weeks and weeks is, hey, you're too focused on Roman. Mm-hmm. And then Punk comes out, and, and all of a sudden, Drew's got blinders on, and all he sees is Punk. And what happens? Seth is in the ring with him, medically cleared, super kicks him, and then curb stomps him. Yeah. Like, hey, dude, you might want to look in the mirror here. Exactly. So I thought that segment was brilliant. I really thought yeah. it stole the show. And really led to a strong finale because we went back to Cody and Rock. Oh, yeah, we did. And that one I know got a lot of heat for. Sure. And, I I mean, obviously it made a lot of sense. Yeah. Because with what was going on with Cody getting mm-hmm. beat up by The Rock, and mm-hmm. this is more following up about The Rock concert and, and, the, yep. and the promos The Rock has been yep. doing, yep. really laying it in personally, which I know some fans have been very – Skeptical of? Yeah. But I have to remind people about this, though. The Rock is from that Attitude Era. Yes, he is. This is something for him that is natural. Yeah. And in that time period, if you talk to an Austin, you know, Uh you talk to anybody that was a superstar in that era. Yeah. This is secondhand. Yeah, it is. So this is not, like, so controversial. Right. That... It, it goes all over the place. Well, you know what it reminded me a little bit of in, in regards to Rock beating up Cody? As, as somebody who I've said before, I didn't see the Attitude Era when it happened live. I didn't start till WrestleMania 30. But it reminded me a little bit of like the buildup to when Roman took on Triple H at WrestleMania 32, mm. where leading up to like Roman beat the holy hell out of Triple H. Triple H came back. He won the belt. And then it was just like them beating the holy shit out of each other. 
in the weeks leading up to Mania. Yeah. It's, it's what it reminded me of a little bit. Well, that's what they're doing because obviously with Cody, they really want him to have that underdog feel. Right. And it's and it, they're literally trying to put like the entire mountain range, so to speak, mm-hmm. between him and his goal. I mean, you think about how many, you know, uh, he had to go through Seth three times. You know, before and then he he lost to Roman, and then he went to team up with Brock Lesnar to take on Roman and get it get his revenge back the night after Mania, and then Brock decided to beat the shit out of him for how many months now? Mm-hmm. You know, and then there was the Shinsuke Nakamura stuff that like literally they've just put mountain in fr- on top of mountain on top of mountain in front of him, and he's sur- uh, surmounted them all. Well, that's the one thing that you want to do to build up the storyline because yeah. Ro- Roman is on that next plane. Like, yes, he is. He is somebody that when he loses, that champion is going to be the one look to carry the company for a while. Uh huh. And Cody is built for that now. When he came over from AEW, let's yeah. face it, I don't think they were ready to, to rush him right to the top, so to speak. I don't know if they have fully understood how ready for the main event he was. Yeah, I mean, we know because we watch all the shows. Right. So it's like for us, it was it was a no-brainer. Right. But to see how Triple H has really built him up and really sold him to the WWE universe, Yeah. that when you see Cody now, let's face it, a lot of the fans don't think AEW when no. they see him. No, no. I think has been a, a big win and to see the rock interact with him too. And especially the rock going completely crazy on him. Oh my Lord. Yeah. Last night. And let's, let's get one thing clear. The placement of the truck in the background folks was not accidental. No, it's not. There are other trucks they have there that are WrestleMania specific that they could have put there to advertise. Hey, WrestleMania is coming, but they decided to put the one with John Cena and Steve Austin's face in the background. Mm-hmm. Any other time of year. Might be yeah, might be a whole bag of nothing, but we're less than two weeks out from WrestleMania. Ain't nothing accidental at this point. Right. And that was the whole point about this the closing segment because The Rock was beating the holy snot out of Cody. Cody was a bloody mess. Shout out to Mother Nature for having it rain at that point because that just added to the aesthetic of like, holy shit, this is crazy. It felt like an action movie. Yes, it did. It or, really did. Or an anime. Mm-hmm. Oh, seriously. It, it had that vibe to it. Yeah. I, I fully agree with that. And then after he got out the Mama Rhodes weightlifting belt and whipped yeah. Cody with it and, yeah. and, and, and wipe the blood on it like that. I mean, it was just the perfect way to end that. That shocked me a little bit because I knew he said he was going to do it, but I figured he'd save it for like Mania or something. No. I didn't expect that for a random episode of Raw. Holy shit. No, I think what they want to do is they want to carry so much momentum into Friday night that Seth Rollins will show up and he'll do something like, I would not doubt he calls out Roman or Rock and they try try teasing a one-on-one. Yeah. Just in the meantime... To build something up, I mean, it won't happen because of no, reasons. No, but you'll see something like that, or Cody comes back, he'll jump through the crowd and, and do some kind of schmas there. Yeah, but they're doing a great job about selling him as the underdog. That going into Mania, there's no way you can't get really behind him. Mm-hmm. But it's very interesting how they want to play this because if Cody doesn't win, which I mean is a possibility, right? Where do you go from here? The other thing to keep in mind, too, was in the background of one of the backstage segments uh, after the punk McIntyre Rollins bit Mm -hmm. was when DIY uh, New Day and then R-Truth and Miz were backstage. If you didn't see it, Drew McIntyre was in the background talking to a certain wise man. Yeah, I saw that. Which Uh, might be something, might not be something, just something to keep in the back of your mind. Well, I think that creative especially triple h wants to keep fans guessing sure we live in this day and age where everybody is so amped to learn spoilers and not watch the show play out sure that i think that they want to keep fans completely on the edge of their seat going into mania that we don't know when we're watching the show Mm -hmm. what we're going to be watching yeah and that's great because if it's too predictable it's not fun right and that's something that i think triple h has really emphasized with this run that we're seeing the rock go into a place that we haven't seen him gone in many years. Yeah, even beyond that place many years ago. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing Cody Rhodes really emerge as the superstar they want him to be. Yeah. Whether it's enough to get the job done at Mania, I mean... I would think so. You would have to. I mean, we'll we'll be given the preview next week, but I mean... Because anything anything involving Rock after Mania is going to be hard to do because... his filming schedule is probably going to ramp right back up again. Oh, yeah. So he'll be he'll be out of action, so to speak, for the rest of the year. Yeah, so they'll have to really make and, sure. And then at that point, where do you go? If he, Let's just you know entertain the idea for a minute. If Roman retains, where do you go? 
You know, they got a year out of Cody losing. I don't, they couldn't do it again. You know, no, who, who I knows? Mean, I mean, I know there's been talk about extending it to the Madison Square Garden house show. Oh, okay. It, the, I mean, that ties back to where Dusty originally got screwed over for the belt way back right, when and right. and do something like that. I mean, maybe, but I don't, I don't, uh, I, I just, I think it's not, like now is the time. But I mean, we'll get into it a little later yeah. as the week is going on, yeah. but. I mean, what a Monday Night Raw to cap things off. I mean, I think we hit all the big stories that were going on. Anything else that kind of stuck out to you? Uh, Ricochet, J.D. McDonough, match of the night. Holy fuck. Oh, that, easily. That was insane. Candice LeRae, interesting to see what she's got going on. Uh, if you saw the little video of bonus feature after the show, uh, Indy Hartwell might not be totally down with that. I love the fact that they're pushing Candice as a heel. Yes. Candice is one of the best wrestlers on the planet yes and i think that she just hasn't found that gimmick yet at wwe i mean she's she absolutely destroyed it on the indies Mm -hmm. so to see her get some time on tv and she's running with it Mm -hmm. i think is huge and especially in that women's division they really need a a like a true heel yeah because rhea ripley is transitioning into a face whether they want to or not yep and even with the promo she did with becky lynch which was great Mm mm-hmm the crowd was still kind of behind Rhea, which was yep. nuts. Yep. So I don't know how that's going to play out. Yeah. But to see Candace get on there, I thought it was great. And I agree with it. Ricochet getting TV time and, and having great matches against Judgment Day. That fucking Canadian destroyer. Um, oh, my God. He is just a freak of nature. Oh, my God. Like the stuff he can do in the ring when you give him time and an opponent that, I mean, J.D. McDonough, listen, if, if you don't truly appreciate what he does, mm-hmm. he is sells moves like nobody else on that roster right now. Yep. The closest person we had to that was Dolph Ziggler. Ziggler. But Ziggler's gone. Yep. So that being said, JD and him is magic. I don't mind seeing that match get ran back at some point. Also, shout out to McAfee for calling uh, Ricochet a Puma the last two yes. weeks. Yes. I love that. Shout out to Lucha Underground. God, I missed that show. But a show that I won't be missing is WrestleMania as it's coming up. I mean, WWE is clicking on all yeah. cylinders. NXT is picking up some steam as well. Yeah. Going to stand and deliver. So if you're a WWE fan, there's a lot to win right now. And even if you're an AEW fan, I know we don't talk about them because of reasons. That They've been improving. I want to see them continue on their success right now because they've had a, a pretty solid dynamite this past week. Yeah. They need to continue on that moving forward. But the talk of this week is uh, WrestleMania, so definitely hit us up on the hashtag, hashtag ODPHPod. What was your takeaways from the CM Punk promo on Monday Night Raw? How about Cody and Rock getting really dramatic at the end of the show? And what else has been going on that you want to talk about in the land of pro wrestling? We'd definitely talk about it with you here on the ODPH. And if you want even more pro wrestling talk, make sure to check out every Thursday night, 8 p.m., except for our WrestleMania special edition, which was announced That'll be taking place at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Nerd Initiative YouTube, Wrestling Night Live, where Rich from 3FN, our guy Nick, a.k.a. New Guy Nick, uh, and yours truly will be talking uh, everything in the land of pro wrestling. we definitely having those conversations with everybody as well. So make sure to check it out, and let's talk some pro wrestling, shall we? But first, got to take a break. We'll be right back. This is Tom from Tom Joe Lou. This is Matt from Sideman Sounds. And you're listening to ODPH Podcast. Wanna go where no one knows my name To the desert, the oceans, or the plains Cause I wanna... Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the sports edition of the ODPH. That's a mouthful, so I'll let Pad take it away. Yeah, I got uh, just a local minute this week to talk about. And, of course, coming up very shortly here next week, uh, Friday specifically, as we... Uh, we record is the start of the baseball season here in Binghamton. Rumble Ponies baseball is back. They're opening the season at home for a three game series against New Hampshire. Uh, they have games on Friday, uh, April 5th, 6 35 PM Eastern Saturday, April 6th, 1 5 PM Eastern. And then Sunday at 1 5 PM Eastern, a couple promotions they got going on. Obviously 
Uh, the Friday game is the first game of the season, so it will be a fireworks game as well. Uh, then you've got a uh, it, they're going to be giving out magnet schedule giveaway. This will help you keep track of okay. games if you want to go to a game this year. Also should note, singing the national anthem on opening day is going to be Alyssa Crosby. Oh, okay. Who is a local, uh, Binghamton local, who was on Team Reba from this season of The Voice. Uh, so she will be singing the national anthem there. Uh, then when it comes to Saturday, it is Trapper Hat Giveaway. Uh, the first 1,000 fans in attendance will receive a Trapper Hat to keep you warm in the colder weather. Uh, so definitely got that going on. It is also a downtown double header. A uh, little tease of the, uh, the Binghamton Black Bears, but this uh, says home run goal. The Binghamton Rumble Ponies and Binghamton Black Bears are teaming up for a downtown double header. Get a ticket to the Binghamton Black Bears game and Rumble Ponies game for a package deal. Uh, and then Sunday is Kids Eat Free Sunday. So this one, it says, every Sunday, kids eat free at the ballpark. Thanks to our friends at McDonald's, Mac Clark. All children, 12 and under, will receive a voucher for a hot dog and small soda. Uh, and then it is also Senior Stroll Sunday. So it says, every Sunday at Morabito Stadium is a home instead in uh, Senior Stroll Sunday. All fans, 60 and older, can take advantage of discounted ticket specials at the Visions Federal Credit Union starting gate box office. For the first 30 minutes that gates are open, all fans can take a stroll around the warning track. Uh, so definitely got that going on. And like I said, that starts on Friday, April the 5th. Baseball season almost here. Love going to the games at the stadium. Absolutely. Man. Like I say, if you get a chance to go to minor league baseball wherever you're yeah. at, like majors is great if you live in a big city. But yeah. minor league baseball, there's always something fun about Never it. Never know who it. you're going to see that could turn up on the majors. Very, uh, very true. Very shortly. And then we got to talk some hockey. And looking at the standings for the Federal Prospects Hockey League, that is, of course, the league our local Binghamton Black Bears playing. Another week. Still in first place. Let's go. And, of course, uh, with this past weekend, the Binghamton Black Bears did clinch the Empire Division. Uh, so they are in first place through 48 games played uh, with 31 wins in regulation, eight losses, seven losses in overtime uh, or shootout. Uh, then they've got no wins in overtime, but they do have two shootout wins. Uh, they're in first place with 104 points. Motor City's in second place with 85 points. Danbury's in third with 83 points. Elmira's in fourth with 54 points. And then Watertown's in fifth place with 54 points. In the Empire Division, it is Binghamton, Motor City, and Danbury. They have all clinched uh, playoff spots. And then in the Continental Division, that's the other division in the Federal Prospects Hockey League, Columbus, Carolina, and Port Huron have clinched playoff spots. Uh, who plays where and who's playing who? In the playoffs, don't know yet. It's not uh, that that schedule's not out yet, so we will keep a, an eye on that, and we'll let you know when that comes. Uh, looking at their games from this past week, though, Friday, March twenty second, they had a home game against the Watertown Wolves, where they won by the final score of five to two. Uh, Saturday, they were on the road against those same Watertown Wolves. They lost this game though by the final score of four to two. Came back Sunday. Uh, March 24th against the Watertown Wolves on the road. Lost that one by the final score of 4-3. to three. Uh, So looking ahead to the games they have this upcoming weekend, got a couple of games this weekend. Uh, both of them are on the road. Uh, Friday, March 29th at 7 to 5 p.m. Eastern, they are playing the Port Huron Prowlers. Then on Saturday, March 30th, 6 to 5 p.m. Eastern, they are on the road playing the Motor City Rockers. Uh, they do not come home until Friday, April 5th. Uh, so they definitely got a bit of time before then. But for more tickets, information, all that good stuff, BinghamtonBlackBears.com. Can't go wrong with that. Playoff hockey is just around yeah. the corner. Yeah. So you got you to gotta love it. Absolutely. I mean, especially when we're talking about our New York Rangers. Yes. Still in first place in that Metropolitan Division, 47 and 20. Hey. Oh, that's so good saying. But Carolina is right behind them. Coming in hot. Point-wise. Well, I tell you what, Rangers have, at least if, if we're going to be doing uh, win two, lose one, at yeah. least they've been very consistent with the streak. Yeah. I mean, when they went on that big tear, you know, obviously that was something but yep. they have come back to earth, but it's currently on a two-game winning streak, defeating Boston and Florida. Got the Flyers coming up tonight as we record, so definitely is Blue Shirt Nation all day, every day, yeah. as far as that goes. The Knicks you know, have been looking good in the NBA. I mean, obviously, things are getting a little, little interesting there yeah. concerning how teams are shaping up, but it's still a fun time to be watching the NBA because as they're going to be approaching playoffs and really making those big pushes... I'm I'm excited to see what the Knicks are doing. They've been uh -huh. they've been looking good lately, so definitely a lot of potential happening going on there. Yeah. But when we're talking basketball, I mean, I think there's one way to perfectly end this and Pat. Yeah. We got to talk about the final four. Yeah, of course, college basketball men's tournament still going on. 
Still going on. Some surprises has happened. I will say this. I think my game of the weekend, which I I still am blown away by this, uh huh, was Houston and Texas A and M. That was nuts. That was the number one versus number nine in the South Division. Houston, who I have said before, I think is my is my pick to win. Uh huh. What a game. Like, if you wanted... That went on super late, too, here on the East Coast. I was laying in bed watching the end of that game. Mm -hmm. And the dramatics of it. Like, if you want just a prime example of, like, why March Madness matters. Yeah. You watch this game. Houston is up big. I mean, they let the lead kind of slip away. Texas A&M puts on, like, a 13-1 to run in the last three minutes of the game. And they're down by three... Houston's big players are following out left and right. Right. Just because just how the physical game the game was. Right. Texas A&M gets a toss in with like point whatever seconds left. Like it's there's no time left. They literally have to catch the ball and shoot it. The guy does on a wide open 3 and just throws it up. Like it's it's one of the ugliest shots you'll see. Yeah. Nails it. Yeah. Sending it to overtime. And I honestly thought like at this point Houston is done. Right, because they literally had nothing left. Their their players were all tired and gassed out, and it's a it's a testament to how they wanted to win this game over anything. Yeah, and that's what kept them in there. Like it it was just wild to see. Yeah, how they stepped to stepped up to do it, and like I say, Jamal Sheed, who plays for Houston, was absolutely just uh, phenomenal in this game too. I definitely have to shout them out. Uh, shout him out because, like I say, when they needed him, he came up clutch, and like they just literally laid it all on the the court. Yeah. Both teams did too. Yeah, but it was just wild to see how the game played out. Yeah, and can, in comparison, I mean, was there any games that really stood out to you? I mean, not really necessarily any games with a player that stood out to me because, admittedly, I am not that familiar with Purdue basketball. You know, being where we are in the, in the eastern East Coast, you know, we we get a lot of ACC, a little bit of Big East, not too much Big Ten. Uh, basketball, football, that's a whole other story between, you know, Penn, Penn State being down there. But basketball, eh, not so much. But I was not familiar with Zach Eady, I think is how you say his name. Saw the gameplay. So saw their one of their first games over the weekend and went, holy fuck, who is that dude? Because I had not, like I said, I had not heard of this guy. He's a senior out of Toronto, Ontario. Uh, listed, listed height, seven foot four. Wow. Oh, my God. I saw this kid and I was like, this, I don't know if this kid's any good or not, but he looks impressive. Yo, you know, so I, I saw a little bit of his gameplay. He impressed me a lot. As someone, admittedly, about all I know about Purdue is boiler up. Yeah, you know that, that's about all I know for Purdue basketball. Impressed the hell out of me. So good luck to that kid. Yeah, no, I mean Purdue is still in it. I mean your your matchups for the Sweet Sixteen. Houston and Duke are going to be taking on each other in a. That's going to be my game of the weekend. Yeah, not should. because I'm a Duke fan, but. I mean, you're talking about it, Pat? No, yeah, that, sh- that one should be money. Uh, the other one I would say keep an eye out on should be good is uh, Purdue and Gonzaga. Because Gonzaga, regular season, not bad. When it comes to tourney, though, usually pretty good. Gonzaga put on a statement win against Kansas. Oh, yeah, they did. That was embarrassing. Yeah, I've, 89-68. I've never seen a Bill Self team look that bad in a, in a playoff game like this. Yeah. But Purdue and Gonzaga, that's going to be a a money one to watch. (laughs) They're winning games in the tournament by margin twenty. Yeah, like like they they understand the assignment and they do not want to have another losing tournament. Yeah, which I like. Listen, I applaud them, but I mean, going against Purdue, that's going to be a tough task. Creighton and Tennessee. Well, we know one person who's rooting for that game. Yeah, I would expect. I I have been getting messages from the 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 king of the nerdy South. Uh, Looked it up. Gonzaga Purdue Purdue is favored by five and a half. Ooh. Well, I mean, like I said, you're going to see a lot of those close margins in this one. Yeah. I don't think there's any real big Cinderella's. I mean, you can argue Clemson and Arizona. Clemson uh, Creighton a to a certain degree, I would say. Well, Creighton was like the I, third like seed. I know, like, I know they're three, but, like, do you really expect Creighton to go that far? No, I didn't. I mean, they're flying under the radar, but they're, they've looked great in the games. I mean, I thought Oregon was going to take that one until late, right. but, you know, yeah. Creighton, Creighton yeah. did what they did, they do. Like I say, when when I caught the game, I should say, yeah. that one, uh, there's a lot going on there's this weekend. There's a lot going on. Yeah. But Clemson, Arizona, North Carolina, and Alabama. Boy, that, that's two of your favorite teams to root for. Yeah, that's why I say I'm, I'm, che- I'm cheering for whoever's coming out of the other double, side of the bracket. Double elimination. Like, listen, I'll be happy with that. And then Illinois and Iowa State, and then UConn and San Diego State. So, I mean, yeah. we got some fun basketball this weekend. 
I so hit us up on the hashtag hashtag ODPHPod. How's your team doing in the bracket? How is your bracket doing? My bracket is still good. I know for our group, uh, I am in second place. Uh, but then the one I really care about in, on ESPN, I'm in the first take group. I am beating Stephen A. Molly Karam and Chris Russo, and that's all I care about. Take your victory lap, Pat. I am better than Stephen A. Mad Dog and Molly. That's all I care about. Tweet it out. Let them know. That being said, for anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. That's it for sports this week. So for the one and only Pat Awanje, fuck the Astros. I'm your host, Kenna. Thank you as always listening to the ODPH Podcast. We'll see you next time. Such waste of time Swiping left and swiping right On people you could know Cause anyone who's worth a damn Be worth way more than a picture could ever show You can find the right light Find the right angle And never find your soul And it can feel like a losing battle And this plot is full of holes This modern way of finding love Just makes me feel so alone And I can't be the only one Sick of staring at my phone So look up Talk to me A better way to spend our energy Just look up Talk to me time fable everyone has just one true love all i know is you're across this table and you're all i'm thinking of so look up talk to me a better way to spend our energy just look up talk to me Swiping left and swiping right on people you could know.